Okay, we can start. So uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you very much to be uh, with us in this, uh, this uh, first uh, webinar on uh, India. Thank you very much uh, to Subhash Agrawal. And it is our uh, expert uh, for today. is a member also of the steering committee of the Observatory on India. Uh, thanks to uh, Sergio Dogaresi, the coordinator of the observatory. And thanks to the people that are connected with us. Um, this is the, the first um, uh, webinar of a cycle um, on, uh, on India, a country that uh, is becoming more and more important at the global level and strategic also. Um, for uh, uh, for us, for Italy, for Europe. So we uh, we we want to uh, to look inside, you know, uh, to to this uh, to this country. Thanks to the uh, a community of experts that we are uh, uh, building as uh, observatory in India is um, an observatory, one of the observatories that Chespi has um, started in these last years uh, uh, with the idea to open. A, a research area, but also uh, a, a space of dialogue and uh, uh, discussion about a uh, specific issue, uh, uh, geographic or thematic. Uh, so uh, this webinar wants to be a, a short window, a very light format. Uh, we uh, that, uh, want to go deeper in some um, uh, topics. Uh, the, the um, and in just one hour, uh, practically there will be the the, the main uh, uh, speech uh, from an expert in this case uh, uh, Subhash Agrawal, and uh, and then we have a time uh, half an hour or more half, half an hour uh, to uh, collect uh, observation uh, uh, questions uh, uh, whatever you you want to share on the uh, chat box or, or in the uh, Q&A uh, function. So uh, thank you uh, very much. I give the floor to uh, Sergio Lugaresi that will moderate the today uh, webinar and buona sporto. Thank you, Daniele. You have, you have introduced uh, the meeting already. So is, uh, let's start the journey. The, the, the series of seminar is uh, entitled The Journey Through Contemporary India dialogues with experts and uh, the expert we have today is Subhash Agraval who is a journalist a political analyst a commentator based in New Delhi he has a published book work for newspaper in India but also abroad in Europe and in particular in Italy with uh, La Stampa and uh, um, Il Sole 24 Ore. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Daniele said, uh, the presentation will last 20, 30 minutes, and then we have, uh, we have a space to, for questions that I kindly ask you to write in the chat box, and then we, we forward them to, uh, to Subhash. Please, Subhash, let the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Daniele. I'm uh, very... Uh... I'm very flattered to be invited to give this uh, first webinar of the uh, of Chespi on India, and I am um, also very happy that Chespi has taken uh, this initiative to start a very uh, India-focused observatory, uh, which is, I think, a first in Italy. So I'm very delighted about that. My links with Italy go back personally 40 years, professionally about 30 years. Professor Michael Guglielmo Tori, who is also on the steering committee along with Sergio and I, and Daniele is, uh, has been a friend and a colleague of mine for the last 30 years, running the Ital India Foundation. So I have had the good fortune of dealing and meeting some excellent Italian thinkers, um, professors, academics, journalists, and even CEOs. Um, India is a fascinating country, but also very complex. So I don't know if I'll be able to do anything close to even even close to justice in just 30 minutes, but I will try. Uh, it takes a lifetime to understand India. I still haven't done it. There's a very famous uh, saying in India, especially within the foreign correspondent circle, that when you come to India, you feel you can write a book. After one year, you can barely write a page. So it's like that old Churchillian saying that everything that is true about India, the opposite is equally true. So it's it's a country of uh, of uh, contrast. It's a country of extreme dialectic 
uh, dilemmas and uh, and diversity. And uh, next, please. And Daniel, the next slide, please. And it's a country of almost uh, 16, 17 major language groups. Just to show you um, the um, how diverse it is. It's also a country where the rich and the poor coexist. Next, please. It's also a country where the rich and poor coexist, urban and rural, uh, 20 sec 21st century and the 18th century. And this is uh, encapsulated in this co uh, cartoon, which actually appeared in the Washington Post. Um, for those of my uh, of my friends and colleagues who are listening to this podcast blog and uh, watching this live stream and who don't know India well or who are too young to have visited India and don't understand what diversity really means or did when India was pre-reformed. Let me just turn you to this photograph. Next, please. In 1981, when India launched its first satellite, this is a true picture, the first satellite of India was taken by a bullock cart to the satellite launch base. This is Insat 1A, a very famous satellite. Most Indians my, my age and my generation will know about it. This launched India into the space age and uh, India has now, of course, sent a moon to the mission, a moon to, to uh, a mission to moon, a mission to Mars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It has also one of the, I think is the third largest commercial uh, player in the private space exploration and, and space uh, and satellite launch uh, system in the world. So it has a very viable, very long, very robust and very profitable space program. Next, please. In any case, that was India then, and this is India now. India really started in 1991 when a new India was sort of, in a way, was shaped or began to be shaped because of the reforms, economic reforms brought about by by um, by uh, financial and economic uh, um, uh, issues that the government of that day was facing. A foreign exchange was down to about just two weeks of cover. There was hardly any foreign investment coming in. Uh, we had exhausted almost all our World Bank and IMF loan, uh, uh, you know, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So we were in a real mess. And that's when, under those circumstances, India was forced to open up to the world economy and look at what it has produced. The results of opening up in, in pure economic policy, business, foreign investment, trade, stock markets, foreign portfolio investments, entrepreneurship, innovation. Oh, there's a whole list of things that I don't want to repeat. I will presume that in large part, the audience today knows is very familiar with this, but look at just the growth. In the first 25 years from 1991 to 2016, it was just phenomenal. Of course, every government of the day pushed it. It wasn't just the Congress or the BJP, the Congress government of the day started it, of course, under then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and then Foreign Minister and later Prime Minister, uh, then Prime Minister uh, Narsimha Rao, I beg your pardon, and future uh, Prime Minister and then Finance Minister Manmohan Singh. But every government of the day has actually pushed it at some level or the other. There's been political football played with reforms and economic liberalization. In the early days, uh, this was a bad word. While in opposition, while outside of office, most parties opposed it, including the Congress, including the BJP, including the other parties, regional parties. But once in office, and they've all been in office, they've all supported it very eagerly, keenly, and maybe with some mistakes, with some misjudgments, with some missteps, but they have nevertheless embraced it. And this is where we are. There is a political consensus, not, not spoken aloud, but very clearly there that India wants to open up, India wants to engage with the world, India wants to be part of the world. Next, please. Since that, in the last 10 years, the economic growth, the GDP growth, the per capita growth, and the annual percentage change in the, is, is here. We have registered almost above 6.8% in the last 10 years. Our per capita income in dollar terms is almost uh, uh, 2,700 or uh, some 2,700 dollars, and our uh, our um, GDP in the year 2024. And India does it from March to March. So as of 31st of March 2024, our India's GDP had touched 
four trillion dollars. It's taken us. Uh, we have shortened the time to uh, add one trillion to the economy. It took us fifty years to reach one trillion. It took us ten years, fifteen years to reach the second trillion. It took us another ten years or seven years to reach the third trillion, and it's only taken us five years to reach the fourth trillion dollars. And the projection is that India will be a five trillion dollar economy in the next three years, if not earlier. That is if everything goes according to current uh, trends. Next, please. India is now the fourth largest economy in the world. It overtook um, Germany sometime in, um, in the summer, early summer. Uh, this slide is useful. I've actually copied, borrowed this from the BCBC because it shows India and UK, and this has a particular poignant significance for Indians who remember and still have a connect, a memory connect with British rule in India for 200 years. To race ahead of the colonial, the country that ruled over you for 20, 200 years is quite an achievement and something that Indians do flaunt a lot. Next, please. The GDP, per, but having said that, the GDP per capita, India's progress has been real, it's been substantive, it's been multi-layered, and I'll come to that in a minute. But having said that, the huge population diminishes the, the, the impact of the macro trends. And as a result of that, India's per capita is still very, very low. This is actually, uh, um, it's 2,400, 2,500. I think it's gone up to about 2,600 as we speak in September, but it's still very, very low. It's, less, it's lower, in fact, than South Africa and Brazil, India's two partners in, uh, in uh, BRICS. Next, please. So clearly there is a problem of about, next slide, please. So clearly there is a there is a issue about uh, on a per capita basis, on a macro level, at a country level, India is doing very well. It seems to be doing very well, but at a per capita level, it's still got a long way to go. But projecting ahead, if things go as they are going, uh, India should reach close to 5,000 uh, per capita income of $5,000 by the year 2030. But it will not be evenly and uniformly. Um, it will not be even and uniform across across the country. There is a huge inequality in terms of income levels, in terms of jobs, in terms of prosperity, in terms of housing, in terms of access to basic services in India today, and it will continue even after five or six years. And this map shows it that some states, in fact, for state like Goa, for instance, is almost at the level of of, of uh, South American countries, Delhi also, but states like Bihar and Jharkhand fall way behind even most African countries. So India is a deeply unequal uh, country in terms of geography, in terms of uh, city versus rural. And I'll come to the rural districts because that's a big, big challenge. So it's a deeply unequal country, and that is one of the big challenges that faces India, despite all the good news. Next, please. But having, and then I'll come to the problems, but I just want to point out that India's growth is not flimsy, it's not superficial, it's not transient, it's very much here to stay, it's very solid, it's very robust, it's very widespread, and it's very deep. Uh, and this, this chart gives you a sense of how the pyramid, if you look at the base of the pyramid and going up to the high net worth individuals in India uh, or households actually, how that is changing. It has changed from 2005 to 2018 and it's how it's gonna change from there to 2030. The total number of uh, high income and upper high income families will be almost uh, one out of two. So every second family in India will be a high income family comparable to the best in Southeast Asia or the best in or the middle income groups of Eastern Europe and Central Europe. That's a huge middle class. That's a huge middle class. That's an attraction. That's a strength. That's a political and it gives political res social resilience. It gives political clarity and focus. It gives a political direction to the parties. And it obviously gives economic ballast to the country to have capital available, saving capital entrepreneurship uh, available through this rise of this middle class and upper middle class. And I'll come to that and I'll talk about the middle class in just a second. But I just want to go over, next please. 
I just want to go over some of the other other markers of how India, how 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 India's reforms have produced results and how how India's opening has uh, created this economic uh, um, big band effect. Uh, this is the car sales. India is now already the second fastest growing auto market in the world after China. Could well overtake China if China slows down, as is suspected and is being talked about. And uh, in uh, when when reform started in 1991, when India opened up, there were car sales, annual car sales were perhaps only about 100,000 a year. Now we're down, we are, we are up to 4 million, or in excess of 4 million. Uh, so that's the car sales. And India still has a lot of room to grow, by the way. There are only 30 cars per 1,000 people in India, well, as against 130 in China, as against 250 for 1,000 people in Mexico. So I'm not even comparing India to a very well-developed European country or America or Canada, but even to say lesser developed countries, India has a lot of headroom to grow with regard to car sales. This is just one, we can go on, we can do this for every sector. We can do this for consumer uh, electronics. We can do this for uh, travel. We can do this for entertainment and food and dining. Uh, we can do this for telecom and mobility. We can do this for almost any category of products and services. And you will see that the Indian consumer demand, it's a local demand. It's not an export oriented economy, at least not yet. It's a demand driven economy. And that's very important to note. And I'll come to that and I'll come to why that is later. Next, please. One of the interesting things that's happened and it's gone largely unnoticed, even by many Indian analysts, is that India's become actually slowly and imperceptibly has gone on to gone up the 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 technology uh, scale and ladder vis-a-vis -vis its import and its production and its manufacture and its exports. So the exports of uh, manufactured goods has now overtaken the exports of commodities like coal and iron ore and pellets and uh, things like that. India was never a manufacturing power. But 10 years ago, under the current dispensation, they started a Make in, a make in India campaign with the focus on manufacturing a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of government uh, regulatory uh, liberalization and facilitation has gone into it. And one of the things that is clearly one of the beneficiaries of all of that effort are India's exports. And this is something quite remarkable, actually. India was always a big exporter of commodities but never a big exporter of manufactured goods. But that has all changed in the last one and a half years. Next, please. Another, uh, another benchmark of, 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 uh, of liberalization, both a benchmark and also one of the reasons why India is doing so well economically is it's investing smartly, starting with the Congress government 30 years ago with successive governments and even now with the current dispensation. As I said, all governments have done it. It is starting, it's investing in infrastructure, highways, bridges, ports, airports, train stations, railway stations, et cetera, et cetera. And in the last 30 years, 95,000 new kilometers of new highways have been constructed, of which 80,000 have been only in the last 15 years, or maybe 10 years recently, in the last, I think it's 10 years. So 95,000 overall in the last 30 years. This is quite a remarkable for, for a country which earlier lacked resources, lacked the will, lacked the focus, lacked the clarity. So India's doing things smartly. It's starting at the right end. It is not spurring consumer demand. It is creating the environment and the ecosystem and the, and the background and the infrastructure where growth is possible, even higher growth is possible. Next, please. All of this is, uh, another benchmark is that India's stock market is already the fourth largest, capital markets is the fourth largest in, in, in the world. It has uh, overtaken Hong Kong earlier this year and may, may overtake uh, uh, Japan. And India has uh, more, uh, 
listed companies uh, on a stock market than almost any other developing country in the world. So uh, capital, this is not such a, in my eyes, this is not the primary, uh, should be the primary metric of a country's success, but this is another way to measure how well India is doing. And a large part of this uh, uh, of this market capitalization is because the Indian stock market has done very well. A lot of portfolio funds from overseas are, is coming in. Um, and uh, Indian investors, retail investors have become very big players themselves. Next, please. One of the things that the current government has done in the last 10 years is that they changed the... Uh, they um, they made it easy. They changed the tax laws. They brought the rates down. They made uh, compliance easier. They incentivized things that people so that people would comply with paying taxes. They brought in e-governance and e-payment and all of the technology that there was and there is that uh, made it easy for people to pay taxes. So it's electronic filing. Nobody has to sign forms. It's done within a few hours, if not minutes. Uh, there is a lot of database already there with the government, so you can just cross-check. And, and the result is this, that uh, starting with 1991, when there were only about 1.2 million taxpayers, consumers, direct citizens, not, not companies, retail taxpayers, there are now about 80 million taxpayers as of 2024. And the direct tax collection now exceeds the corporate tax collection. This is a remarkable, again, a very remarkable turnaround in Indian story. Over the last 70 years, as we grew up, those of us of my generation who grew up in the 1960s and 70s, we're used to very there being very few affluent people or very few people in the tax net. And most of the tax burden coming from corporates. This has changed. Direct taxes now carry the larger, larger load in the country than indirect taxes. This is amazing. This is a great turnaround. Next, please. Another thing that the current government has done in the last 10 years mm -hmm. is uh, to talk about, to bring in a thing called the goods and services tax, which is very similar to what uh, what is VAT in Europe. Um, before this, there was very, it's a, it was a convoluted, complex, confusing web of laws, which where some products had duty on them before they became a component into the other. So there was a whole, there was many loopholes, many, uh, 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 basically almost three fourths of, of what could be taxed escaped the tax net. That has been professionally, methodically plugged by bringing in the GST. It was brought in, there were a lot of, there was some pain, there were a lot of protests. There was some protests, there was some pain. It was not readily received. It was brought in in 2016, 17, but after that, in the last five, six years, it's shown to be a proven to be a big success. And now you have almost uh, annual collection of something like 200 billion US dollars from GST. Uh, that's quite. That's again one of the uh, aspects of reforms, which is a smart, smart way of dealing with, 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 with reforms. What, what? These series of government actions have done in India, openings have done in India, is not just uh, opened up to international trade and international investment, but created, expanded the pie so that it can be shared. The tax revenue has gone up so that money can be put into social schemes, social welfare programs, uh, investment in base of the pyramid, uh, targeting base of the pyramid, poor people, underprivileged people, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's, that's something that India has never really had. This is one of the... India is really in a soft spot in that sense, that now we have the money and the means to generate it within ourselves for our own programs, for our own uh, uh, social schemes, et cetera. Next, please. And the, this is, I would say, this is probably one of the most important aspects of the, of, uh, the reforms that has been undertaken in the last 10 years. Uh, though the foundation was perhaps laid uh, 15 years ago. It started as a unique identity for Indians in 2009 under the Congress regime, which was then uh, married and taken up a notch by the current dispensation 
to link it with bank accounts, with health insurance, with tax data. So this digitalization has been such a boon that now everybody in India pays digitally. You can buy a cigarette, one cigarette, not just one packet, one cigarette, a newspaper, an apple, a Coca-Cola, a meal, uh, air ticket, a doctor's appointment. You can pay it through your phone on the spot. The, this digitalization is just, I mean, you have to really experience this uh, in India to see how extensive it is, how smooth and seamless it is and how it has changed and transformed lives uh, in, in, a, in, in, in many ways. Uh, and there are 14.4 billion transactions, digital payment transactions in India in a month, which is the highest. In fact, India represents 46% of all digital banking transactions in the world, 46%. And this UPI, United, uh, um, United Unified Payment Interface, has in a way changed the whole economic and social ecosystem of India, especially for poor people. They can now send money easily back home. They can buy things, they can receive money. Small kiosk owners, small vendors, small shopkeepers, small uh, individual uh, craftsmen and semi-skilled workers like plumbers uh, don't need a bank account, don't have to worry about, they can receive money on the spot for their labor, for their services. Uh, this kind of appropriate technology, I wouldn't call it high technology, but the right amount of smart technology has made a, it's been a real transformational change in India in the last 10, 15 years, 10 years. Uh, the, actual, the actual change happened in 2016, but I say 10, 15 years because I want to include and give credit to the previous administration and governments for having brought in the UID, the unique identity in 2009. So it's in a way 15 years. The foundation was there 15 years ago, but the real harvesting was done six years ago. And now this technology, UPI, through your smartphone, through your tablet, through anything, is available to villagers and farmers through even voice control automation. Uh, they have access to digital payments. They have access to... Uh, this, this, it has transformed the, the rural, uh, the ease with which rural people handle money. And I think this has been one of the true landmark policy reforms that has been undertaking in India. And I wanted to highlight that for the international audience because not enough people don't know enough about it. They may have heard here, there, but this has really changed the whole land. It's been a game changer. Thank you. Next one, please. So I've touched on all the wonderful things that India has gone through, the reforms, the policy changes, the GDP growth, capital market growth, the world rankings, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is that India remains a poor country in a macro level, and it remains a crowded and congested and populated country. And it also remains an underskilled and underemployed and if not unemployed country. Huge challenges remain, especially with regard to population and uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to rural economy. The problem with population is that if you don't we don't reduce it, we don't educate them, we don't, if we don't educate it, we don't skill it, we don't employ it, then it'll drift either, in, it'll either migrate to cities, which is already happening in India, or it'll protest, it'll, it'll, uh, there will be more social uh, disharmony and um, more polarized, uh, social polarization. Uh, or they will, or they will choose uh, drugs and crime, which is in a way happening in some states. I hate to say this, but in Punjab, it's happening. Uh, Punjab, which used to be one of the most prosperous states in India, has to needs very urgently to reinvent itself because the rural economy, which is largely based on agriculture, has reached a saturation point. And this is, I think, the problem with almost all as areas of India with regard to the rural economy. We have let them be attached in some meaningful or semi-meaningful way to agriculture. And agriculture's share in the GDP has gone down uh, sequentially year after year, decade after decade. It was over 15% at the time of independence. It is down to 18%. Uh, I think it could be 16 or 18% pure agriculture. Uh, there are far too many people employed in agriculture who are not making enough money to keep their homes and their families uh, in, in, in going. And 60%, uh, there are no jobs, unfortunately. 
there is a huge joblessness in rural areas, in the rural economy, in villages and in small towns. And 60% uh, of all jobs, those that do exist, are related to the government, either government or government undertakings or panchayat or government linked bodies. There are no private sector, there are very few private sector jobs. And that needs to be addressed. So this is India has this one of the stark problems that India faces is this, the distress in the rural economy, uh, in the countryside, and all the economic and social manifestations of it that can uh, burst India's balloon, burst India's success balloon. Next, please. The larger social and political impact of economic reforms has been that there's been a rise of an entrepreneurial class, which already existed in a small way, but it has now grown manifold. It has been encouraged. It has been uh, uh, infused with, uh, with, uh, with uh, credit, with technology, with access to foreign technology, with access to foreign know-how. Uh, so th there is th there is a there is a bursting of entrepreneurship in India, and you can see that in green green areas, uh, renewables, hydrogen, solar, healthcare. It is still a very urban phenomena. I give you that, yes, but it is happening. There's also an in, uh, along with the entrepreneurial class, there's an emergence of a very influential. Uh, middle class, influential, not just in terms of um, money, power, and buying power, but also in terms of social and politics, and I'll just talk about it. There's also a greater use of technology, there's greater transparency, there's clearly better governance, at least in some areas, though it, at times you, we may feel that the, it's still the same, India is still very bureaucratic, it's still very over overly governed, and those things are also true, but I think in bits and pieces, and fair amounts of bits and pieces, there is uh, there is ease of doing interacting with the government for many citizens. Uh, there is more economic low leverage overseas. The kind of uh, India Indians have bought assets, uh, companies having bought company, Indian companies having bought companies there, having done joint ventures, employing people. Uh, most people know how many uh, that USA has the largest foreign direct investment in India, but very few people realize that uh, many um, Indian companies employ uh, US uh, nationals as well. In fact, the number is about 60,000. Indian companies today employ about 60,000 US citizens. So that's, there is a leverage over chief. And the, the big change is basically uh, that the whole aesthetic and social role models um, model has changed into entrepreneurship and wealth. Next please. Subhash, there are also some questions coming. So if we can okay. leave. Okay, thanks. Okay. Just very quickly. So I'll come to the middle class. The, yeah, the middle class in middle class is bigger than uh, Europe, East and, and Central. And uh, there is great uh, prosperity, great activity, great optimism in cities, big and small, uh, even in tier one and tier two, tier two and three, tier three cities. Indian students are the second largest. A lot of Indian students are going abroad to study to the US, to UK, to Canada, to Australia. They are the second largest foreign group uh, overseas. There are about half a million Indian students studying abroad. Uh, the success of the Indian diaspora is another uh, validation and uh, of of uh, uh, for the middle class. And the Indian diaspora is not people of Indian origin like Kamala Harris and Nikki Haley. These are people who have grown and studied and worked in India and then made their way abroad and achieved success. So Satya Nadella, the, the uh, CEO of, uh, of uh, Microsoft, or Pichai, Pichai who is the CEO of uh, Google. Just today in the newspaper, there was an article in, uh, in the front page that the head of Sony, uh, Sony Entertainment in USA is now in India. Uh, so uh, the diasporic success is, is a very strong reaffirmation feedback loop for the Indian middle class. And this this middle class in turn has an influence on media, on, uh, on, uh, on, on even how the, uh, on activism, on the issues that are raised by social activists, on the issues that are raised by the media, and even on how political parties respond to the middle class. And I have a very interesting slide. Next, please.
Next, please. This is uh, those of if there are any Indians in our my the audience, they will remember R. K. Lakshman and this cartoon was from Mrs. Indira Gandhi's time. So the this time the middle class is actually pushing political parties in the in instead of the other way around. Next, please. I'll quickly come to India's geopolitics. There's been a major paradigm shift in our foreign policy. Uh, we've gone from rigid ideology in the, in the last 30 years. There's been a major paradigm shift. We've gone from rigid ideology to pragmatism to a confident and clear assertion of our interests. We've gone from non-alignment to implicitly, if, if not directly and overtly being part of the Western Anglosphere. We are very, we have grown close to the USA and there are multiple reasons. Business is one of them, diaspora, the Indian population is one of them. Uh, and USA and India, no two countries do more military exercises on this planet than USA and India do. We are now a hard power. We are both, uh, we have, we buy arms. We are a big importer of arms. We also have soft power. We are an ex import, buy, we buy energy. Uh, we are also a net donor nation to Africa and Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia. So we are, India has many footprints, diplomatic footprints, and the, but some of the big initiatives that's taken in the last, in the last 10, 15 years is BRICS, uh, which most people know about, uh, BIMSTEC, which is actually something that is Indians are very fond of and put a lot of hope on. BIMSTEC stands for the Bay of Bengal uh, Initiative for Multi-Sectoral and technical and economic cooperation. It's quite a bureaucratic mouthful, but it is basically, in a short form, it's SARC without Pakistan. Uh, India is reaching out to the Middle East, it's reaching out to Asia, it's reaching out to uh, to Latin America, China. Uh, it's had an initiative on vaccines, it has an initiative on the solar. It's in fact, it holds the International Solar Alliance in India. Next, please. We can skip the next two actually because India's these talk about India's major concerns. We can skip uh, skip all of this. Just come to energy geopolitics, please. Energy. India's energy. Up. So India's uh, the big concerns of India are obviously security on its borders, which is threatened, uh, is which is at risk because of our relations with Pakistan and China. But the second big priority for India's foreign policy and how, and I'll come to India's relationship with Europe is India's energy politics. And India wants to increase renewables, wants to increase the civilian nuclear energy. Uh, it has reached out to Russia, France, Japan. Um, India, energy security, I say, would one of be the key features of India's foreign policy guiding it. It's a quiet feature. It is not talked about that much, but this this is the meat and potatoes of what Indian foreign policy establishment looks at to ensure that India's growth can be sustained through energy supplies. Next, please. India and EU. How does India see the EU? And what is the relationship? India views EU as a successful uh, trading bloc, but, uh, but not much more than that. We admire the experiment of sharing sovereignty, having common borders, borderless travel, having one uh, currency, and of uh, et cetera, et cetera, and all the economic and social harmonization that come with that. But India feels like, and so do many other countries, that these are either not practical or doable or relevant in South Asia. India does prefer a bilateral focus. We like to talk to Paris separately. We like to talk to Berlin separately, we like to talk to Rome separately, we like to talk to London separately, we like to not go have to go through Brussels. And going through Brussels for trade and investment issues has created some sort of a awkwardness and confusion in our relations with some European countries, especially the small ones, not necessarily Italy. I think with Italy, we have a much more clearer point of contact uh, now, but if with many countries, it has created an awkward and confusing Historically, Europe has always been viewed as a benign and friendly region, but post 9-11, uh, there has been rethinking on its judgment, on its assessments, on its uh, on its policies and postures, especially given its uh, its uh, subscription to the uh, to an agenda post 9-11, started by the uh, under U.S. Uh, AGs. Uh, India, with all its economic success, it's all its 
cultural self-awareness uh, is now much more confident in dealing with Europe, including on trade and investment deals. It is ready, it is willing. But what it does not want Europe is to lecture it on human rights. It wants a little more independent foreign policy thinking on European part and greater sensitivity, sensitivity to India's core concerns. But on the whole, whole I would say that India-European relations are, if not very exciting, uh, they're cordial, they're good. With some individual countries like France, in fact, they're very good. With Italy, there's a huge potential, and I'll talk about that in q and I'm hoping somebody will ask me those questions, but uh, those that potential so far has not been realized, unfortunately. Next, please. So what is the implication for Europe? India is a huge internal market with a young demography, more than 50%, almost 50% of our population is less than 25 years. So the demand is, the, the, the market is... Uh, demand driven it is not export driven the economy is demand driven economy and as a result of that this is almost this that's a hedge against recession and this is it's on a much more stronger footing than almost any other asian economy including china's indian companies will in time become bigger and smarter and more global and it, it italian companies and european companies uh, will come across them and rub shoulders with them either as competitors or as collaborators in the future there are huge new areas opening up for uh, in 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 uh, in India: water, energy, transportation, health. India has huge needs, and Europe has huge expertise. So that's a match, and that's uh, so India is. And lastly, India is not the West. India prides itself on its independence, cultural identity, and its independence, political independence. But it is also not anti-West. If anything, it is actually pro-West. I remember uh, uh, an Italian prime minister many years ago telling a group of us years ago off the record that India is the easternmost province of the Western Empire. He said, don't quote me because we can't use the word empire, but in any case, the point is well taken. So India matters. India matters because of its economic, huge economic opportunity it offers Europe. It matters because of the pool of scientific, technical, and managerial talent it has to be leveraged both within its borders, within India and overseas. It, it matters because it is one of the most moderate cultural cultural societies with with open uh, open societies uh, with a growing middle class it matters because it has a leadership it has a leadership role in south asia and also in the global extended global south it matters because it offers a very viable china plus world alternative for european companies and it also matters because of its influential diaspora which creates a feedback loop on talent information knowledge innovation Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Last. Next, please. So, despite uh, despite all the internal challenges and external uh, vulnerabilities of India, uh, which I believe India can and will face uh, sensibly, despite all of that, I think India's rise is. Definitely genuine, multi-layered, impressive, and I think likely, very, very likely to go forward. India's rise is just not as dramatic as China's, but it is very, very real. In fact, there's a new India in the making, and it's it's difficult to talk about it and project it through a presentation. People have to visit to see how the, the number of projects and policy changes and new ideas and innovation and new companies and new areas and new achievements. I mean, just today, India won a, a test cricket match against Bangladesh in two and a half days, which is unheard of in test history. An Indian got elected to, uh, to got uh, got promoted as the CEO of Sony. These are just casual, small little news. Every day, there are seven, eight of these kind of things. So there's a new India in the making, very successful, pragmatic, but a pragmatic, very influential, globally linked, more confident over itself. And going forward, India wants to become a developed nation by 2047. I personally think that it's a good vision to have, but a lot of things have to be in place for this to come to be to come true. But irrespective of whether this happens or not, India will certainly most certainly play a much, much larger leadership role economically, security-wise, and uh, geopolitically in Asia. With that, thank you very much, and I'm I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Subash. That was uh, really convincing uh, that, I mean, um, India matters. 
Um, and I hope the observatory uh, will be up to the challenge to follow and explain and analyze uh, all the aspects that make India um, uh, important. Uh, of course, uh, India is uh, matters because it's also because it's a big country, is uh, growing, uh, is young, and you explain many. Uh, many of these aspects. And you also uh, highlighted that there are nonetheless uh, some obstacles to growth, some contradictions. You mentioned the urban uh, um, rural uh, divide and uh, the, the jobless uh, growth and also the uh, inequalities, at, at least across regions, but we know also uh, across uh, classes. Um, now the question is how will India matter in the future? Uh, it, will ma it will matter for sure, but can India uh, be so ambitious to challenge the primacy of US and China? That depends uh, mostly on the ability of the country to grow and to remove the obstacle to grow. So I think uh, there are some questions, uh, Subash, in the, uh, in the uh, answers, uh, questions and answers, and also in the chat box, mainly from Anil Vadpa. Thank you. Oh, you can read them there, maybe. Broadly, I think they refer to this big question, what, what, what is going to be the future? What are the... Uh, you know, the, the steps that India needs to take, regional integration, uh, the uh, questions refer to the regional comprehensive uh, economic partnership, uh, the PLI, uh, the uh, relationship with Europe and with Italy. So I think we can uh, um, now, um, you know, give, uh, leave Subhash the time to answer to some of these questions and to uh, and to address this uh, maybe more this issue of the future, and then for sure we can come come back in our seminars on many of these issues you have okay. raised. Okay, thanks, Sergio. I, I I'm going to take a question by from Anil Wadwa, who's uh, who's uh, served as our ambassador, Indian ambassador to Italy, and is a friend of ours, mine. Um, he's Anil is asking. Uh, he's, he, he refers to the rural joblessness, and um, he's asked me to give the figure. Actually, the figures are imprecise. Uh, just like poverty figures in India, there's a lot of contestation on that, even for rural joblessness. But a good, intelligent guesstimate is that it is at least 25%. Uh, the reason why it's imprecise is because in rural areas, people are unemployed, but they are not starving because they're still living in their homes. And they're doing maybe a few, two hours of job here, one hour of job there, or just sort of. So it's, the, the, the joblessness figure is imprecise, but it's very high. Let me put it this way. It's a very high figure. It's a very, it should be troubling for any 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 political party, any policy planner. Uh, what can we do about it? Uh, good question, Anil. I don't know the answer. I wish I was that brilliant. Um, I think many things, many things have to fall in place. They have to be educated. They have to be skilled. That's how, that's the only way they can get jobs, meaningful, sustainable jobs. Uh, that's the first thing. So you have to, you have to, both the demand and supply side have to be addressed. Um, they have to be educated and skilled. They have to be incentivized to do that. So it's not very easy to say that they should be educated because nobody wants to go into a plumbing course because they, there are all kinds of sociological factors working even in the rural economy. It's very interesting. Villagers also want a degree, even though it may be useless because their marriage value goes up in the village. Nobody wants to go to a technical institute with, which will train them to be a, a plumber or a mason or a uh, electrician. So th there are all social factors. So you have to incentivize them. You have to provide the education. You have to provide the training. And then you must link them up with industry preferably where they live. Just attracting them to the to urban areas and to cities, Delhi, Mumbai, 
Bangalore, Chennai is not the answer. Already our cities are overflowing, they are over congested, they are just bursting at the seams. We need to move people back, in fact, to villages. And the only way we can do that is to incentivize industry to set up base there. But again, it's a chicken and egg. Why would industry set up a, a, in a rural area in the middle of nowhere where there are no employed and skilled, uh, employable and skilled labor, uh, labor to tap? So it's a very chicken and egg kind of a situation. I'm not sure I know the answers. I know I, I understand the moving parts and the problem areas, but I don't know what the solution is. There is also in the chat box a question from Paola Pampaloni from the European Union. But please Paola go ahead. Asking, uh, what are the areas for cooperation between India and EU which could be attractive for India? Well, in, uh, there are many. I mean, starting with business and, and technology. I mean, there are huge, India has huge needs and uh, Italy and EU have Europe, EU has European countries have uh, have, have that technology or have experience using that technology, whether it's and uh, so I think that especially with regard to especially with regard to urban renewal, I think that's a very that whether it's wastewater, whether it's uh, um, uh, transportation mobility, I think uh, the way. European cities have developed. There's something very, very, uh, again, this is something for Indians to go and see because that's something very admirable. Unlike Europe, uh, North American cities, which are downtowns and most people live, except for New York and Chicago, but I'm looking at Washington, DC, I'm looking at other areas, LA. Most people live in suburbs. So there is no real downtown and though no living organic. European cities, on the other hand, are very different, whether it's Rome or it's Paris, it's London, it's Berlin. And I think India can learn from that. And that's something that we can cooperate on, urban renewal. And I think that will be the next phase. I think India will, once we have addressed some of the pressing concerns of the rural economy, we will sh put some of our money and attention to urban. And I think that's where Europe is very good at. That's one area. The second area I think we can think of, I can I think right away, and this has been talked about, is together we can do things in, in, in Africa. Italy has been a big aid provider at some level, starting in the 1960s and 70s when it came of age uh, after the Second World War and it started putting money into overseas aid. It used to give money to India and now it, we don't need it. But India itself has developed a lot of, it has money to, and it gives aid to Africa, but also has a lot of links with Africa, a lot of, and it has a lot of understanding of Africa and, and, and the global South. I think India and Europe can come together. India and Italy, India and France can come together and providing appropriate technology, the smart technology, the solutions, uh, promoting social enterprise, not aid, aid, but the, the, the era of aid is over, I think, by and large. But promoting entrepreneurship, innovation, social enterprise in, uh, in, in Africa. And I think that's where India and uh, Europe can come together. So, Bashir, there is also a question from Anna Balestreros on uh, the role of women. I, uh, I don't see it. Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you what the question is? Questions and answer, the, the last one. I have a, I have from Paula, I don't have from Anna. I'm sorry, I my. Uh, now, I Daniele put it also in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Anya is asking what role in it, can India play in future in the world or if its relevance can be considered without women's participation. Considering their percentage in both houses is somewhat below 15%, what attitudes and policies can be implemented to accept a change without borders? How likely is that about to change? Thank you. Good question. Uh, this is a long, this is a, this change is required, Anna. Be, uh, I don't think anybody will disagree with you. Um, but uh, this is a long play. It's not going to happen in one generation. Um, women's participation, again, requires very, it has a similar kind of dynamic and resistance that I talked about rural uh, economy. It needs incentivization. It needs social mindset change. It needs acceptance from both sides, the parents who will educate the girl child and employees who will hire her. Uh, it requires safety. You, uh, 
you know, women have to work in a safe environment. It requires uh, the infrastructure. I totally agree. I think 15%, I'm not so convinced that 15% parliamentary um, representation is any benchmark of how good or bad a company is doing. It's, yeah, it's sort of okay. I wish it was more. But on the ground, you can have a company, uh, you can have a country which is visibly very high with women leaders, but treats its women very poorly. India was one of those. We had a woman prime minister. So did Sri Lanka. I'm not personally so convinced of these big picture, uh, uh, these big changes of women, of, of uh, uh, personality-based changes. I would like to look at, as you said, like look at the ground level. Can women be trained? Can they be educated? Can they be made employable? Can they be linked with industry? Can they be made independent and proud? I absolutely agree. I think that should be on our social and economic agenda. I think that consciousness is there in this government and in previous governments. So I don't lose hope. It's just not the most, the highest priority. Yes. But I think with time, it will become a higher and higher priority. But it's there. In fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi and even six previous governments have done many things to promote women's education in India. In, in the in the chat box now, there are also some questions that Anil raised in the question and answer, so you can maybe address them as well. So uh, Anil is asking that should India join the RCEP? Uh, RCEP is a uh, Asian, for my European friends may not know this, but the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, it's a it's a China-led group that India refused to join about two or three years ago. There has been debate about it, whether in India, there's been a lot of debate about it, whether we did the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, my personal belief is that, yes, we need not, we don't want to unnecessarily uh, make China, help China become a bigger bully than it already is towards us. But I see no reason why India should forsake any opportunity to join a meaningful group where it actually benefits economically. I think we should be secure now. I think India should be more secure about its position, about its ability to negotiate deals, about it not being, about it, about its ability to withstand pressure uh, into signing deals which are which are uh, which are not in its best interest. I think we should be more confident and secure about that. And, and and join groupings like RCEP, which allow us interaction, engagement, and even trade, uh, uh, substantive trade uh, uh, advantages in Asia, in the Asia Pacific context. So yeah, my my sort of citizens' view. I I'm not been in inside government, but my citizens' view is that I think we perhaps might have made a mistake not joining the RCEP. Uh, Anil has also asked a question about the PLI scheme, Suxida. Uh, PLI is uh, productivity linked incentives. Uh, Anil, you'll have to stop using these acronyms. My European, our European friends will not know what you're talking about. Uh, it's a it's a make in India kind of incentive that if you make in India under the make in India scheme, you get a certain subsidy. So for every one thousand televisions you make in India with Indian parts and Indian labor, you will get so much money. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So he's asking, will the PLI scheme succeed in raising manufacturing contribution? It already has, actually. It already has. Manufacturing has gone up. I have the 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 data here. Thank you so much for explaining PLI. I I was looking on the website and I only found post life insurance. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> But PLI is a productivity linked incentives. Uh, it has, uh, it's actually been a big success in chemicals, uh, more than in electronics. Firstly, electronic manufacturing has gone up, electronics exports have gone up. Um, Apple is now manufacturing the i14 and i15, uh, iPhone 14 and iPhone 15 in India. These are all in a large part, not entirely, in a large part due to the PLI, the incentives built into the PLI scheme. So India becoming, a, and now semiconductors, India has just signed a deal with uh, the US for uh, semiconductor chip manufacturing. It's wing Taiwanese companies, it's wing Japanese companies, it's wing American companies, and 
some of these deals negotiations are likely to come through and behind the back story of uh, of this is the pli that indian investors who get into these very sophisticated manufacturing will get certain subsidies from the government of india so that's pli so yeah i think uh, this is a good uh, we didn't believe it we didn't uh, we scoffed at it most of us but it's turned out to be a success uh, i must say hats off to india and to indian engineers and into indian indian labor and productivity thank you subhash uh, so i think we we have um, used all the time uh, perfectly um, and unless you want to add anything subhash or daniele um, we can close the meeting and thank uh, all the participants first of all uh, the, for, for their attention and for the questions and we thank Subhash Agarwal for the wonderful presentation and the very good start of, of our series of webinar we will continue this journey uh, in the future thank you so much thank you. And, and have a nice evening thank you Sergio and thank you Daniele I'm very happy to be part of this uh, program and I look forward to more good luck with the with the Chespi Observatory on India. Thank you. Thank you.